this is indeed a tough subject. And uh, believe it or not, I'm as anxious to get through it as you are. Maybe more so. We're talking about a war. It's a very difficult war to understand. The participants are invisible, but basically uh, much of their activity can be seen and understood by those of us who are uh, literally the objects on the battlefield they're fighting over. This is an unusual war. It's literally broken out in every village on the planet, in every building, in every home, in every city, in every country in the world. The nations are participants. In fact, every act of Congress, every vote in Parliament, every statement by every dictator, politician, representative is a, is a mirror literally reflecting the status of the conflict. But more than that, beloved, every human being in every country and every economic or political strata is a participant as well. You are a participant. Think about it. No one is excluded. No one is exempt. The battle is for the control of lives and the control of, of nations, but it is more than that because the consequences are eternal consequences. The results will end, <coughs> will not end, even when life is through. The battle, of course, is a battle between Satan and God. The armies are the invisible battalions of the angelic host that God has created to be his missionaries in the hearts of men throughout the segment of history that we call time. There are two armies. We remember that because one day before the creation of the world, the most beautiful, most powerful angel of all, an anointed cherub named Lucifer, determined that he would rather be God than serve God. Of course, he couldn't. But he said in his heart, I will, so he could no longer be a slave of the Most High God and the creator of the ends of the earth. He chose to exalt himself above the heavenly host and be like God. As a result, the scripture teaches that he was cast out of heaven, assigned a long-term prison sentence, which would end up with an eternal trip to hell. And with him went perhaps one-third of all of these incredible created spirit beings. And without upheaval, there began the war of wars, a war that will not end, beloved, until Jesus returns again. Until then, the battle will rage. And we've been looking at that battle this last few weeks. We've been looking at the enemy's army, a very difficult subject to look at. And we've been asking the question, just what do demons do all day? This morning, we come to the third part of that. So far, we've determined they're deluded into thinking they can keep men and women from coming to Christ and finding eternal life. They can't, but they don't know that. Every move they make, God uses for his glory. They don't know that either because they don't have the mind of Christ and they don't understand grace. The second thing they do all day, and this they do quite well, is to try to deter and detract us from our first love. From anything, they'll do anything and everything to keep us from worshiping God, from serving Him in spirit and in truth. They'll do anything to keep us from His Word. They'll do anything to keep us from fellowship with Him in prayer. They think they can cause us to lose our salvation. They can't, but still they try. And in the process, they produce scenarios in your life and in my life trying to alter our theology when, and whenever possible trying to keep knowledge from becoming understanding, understanding from becoming wisdom. They'll even encourage us to learn more facts about God provided those facts don't change our lives. We also learn that they try to interfere with the work of God's holy angels whose task it is to minister to us and then finally, last week we learned they're allowed to use physical illness and emotional trauma to cause us to become bitter, discouraged, or angry at God. And we learned last week that God allows it and even initiates it on occasion in order to bring us to a deeper knowledge of himself. They don't understand that, and often neither do we. And so there ensues that constant struggle for us to make the spiritual swift switch to 
to take life's very real experiences and, and try to discover the spiritual work he's trying to do in our lives through even those things that we wish never would have happened. This morning we continue our look at what these demons do all day. They don't sit still. One day they will. They'll be dropped into the frying pan of eternity where they'll be put on slow broil through the endless ages of eternity. Meanwhile, the holy angels will be worshiping with us in adoration and praise, enjoying the richness of fellowship with God that these demons once had and threw away. So our journey continues. This morning we look at the fourth thing demons do all day. They come in the form of what the scripture calls unclean spirits and attempt to tempt and influence our every decision and our every thought. Over and over in Scripture, they are referred to as unclean spirits. I gave you some references in your notes, Zechariah 13, 2, Matthew 12, Mark chapter 1, Mark chapter 3, Mark chapter 5, Mark chapter 7, Luke chapter 8, Luke chapter 9, and on and on. Now, I have here in my notes Luke 9, verse 437. <coughs> If you, if you find that, please let me know. But what is an unclean spirit, anyway? An unclean spirit could better be described as an unholy spirit, perhaps. An unholy spirit is one who tries to do what the Holy Spirit does without God's nature to make it possible. Now, you say, how do we know the difference? How do we know how God's Holy Spirit behaves in and through a person. Well, God told us. That's how we know. Galatians 5.22 says, The fruit of the Spirit, or the reflection of the Spirit, when He is working through your life and through mine, will reveal itself in the following ways. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. <clears throat> Some people think the fruit of the Spirit is love, and love expresses itself in joy, peace, long-suffering. But however you look at it, that's the fruit of the Spirit. That's, that's what God looks like when he lives through your life and through mine. Satan's hosts, not understanding grace, think they can operate in the flesh and either counterfeit or counteract the work of the Spirit. Now, they do it in one of two ways. I should say one of many ways, and these are two of them. Number one, they invade your life with temporal substitutes. Now, what's a temporal substitute? It is a way for you to act like God when it's not really God doing the acting. That's what it is. The second thing they do is invade your life by tempting you to do evil, trying to get you to behave and to think in ways that break the heart of God. And, and they're, they're relentless in their pursuit of us. They are constantly after us it is an escalating battle that when they gain an inch they want a mile now remember that the fruit of the spirit is in you is god's character translated into human behavior that's what it is it's the nature of god translated into human behavior and satan hates that he hates that now remember one other thing and then we'll go on every fruit of the spirit has a corresponding quality in the nature of god that's being reflected. And secondly, remember this, that each one of these fruits of the Spirit is supernatural. If it is a fruit of the Holy Spirit produced in you, the flesh cannot produce it. Remember that. Only God in you can produce the fruit of the Spirit. You say, well, but those are things that a lot of people have. Well, that's where we're getting to. Unregenerate man or woman cannot exhibit the fruit of the Spirit. The Scripture says they can't even not understand them when they see them, for they are spiritually discerned. And that's one of the keys to understanding this lesson this morning. It's a little heavier lesson than some. I think heavy is a good word. It's another word for boring, you know, that teachers use. Anyway, it's a lot like a car without a motor. It, it, an unbeliever trying to produce the fruits of the Spirit, you, you can get out there and get in the driveway and get in a car that doesn't have an engine in it. And you can put it in gear and you can go boom, boom, boom. You can have the best time. But you're not going anywhere. Because there's no power. And trying to counterfeit the works of the Spirit is one of Satan's great goals in life. 
Here's his first ploy. He wants to get you to redefine words using experience as your base rather than scripture. So instead of learning to die so Jesus can live through you, he wants to make us think in the flesh we can produce behavior that's close enough to the real thing that God will be satisfied or we'll be fooled. Now let me give you an example. <clears throat> Love. That's a good one. That's the first fruit of the Spirit. It's a good example. Scriptural love, agape love, is a supernatural expression or outpouring of who God is in your life. It gives itself away, the Scripture teaches, with no regard for worth or response of the recipient. In fact, if you look at Scripture, the less love is returned, the more God seems to pursue because the greater the glory. Now, only a Christian can love, because God is love. And unless you're inhabited by God, you cannot truly love, agape love. It's totally unselfish. Now, listen, God's love, the burden is on what will bless the one you love, even if it does nothing for you in return. Got it? So a husband can love his wife, even if she does not love him back. In fact, Scripture tells him to. A parent can love a rebellious child even though their behavior brings reproach to the family and grief to them. We can because God in us demonstrated his love and that while we were still in rebellion, Christ died for us. So true love, agape love, loves the more when it's rejected or scorned and unappreciated. Now an unbeliever cannot do that. But what's Satan going to do then? He takes that same word in whatever language, in our language it's love, and he gives it a slightly different connotation. He calls it love, but it's really a way to satisfy the physical or emotional needs of the one who's doing the loving. Now, it sounds the same, but it's the exact opposite of God's love. So Satan will disguise himself as an angel of light and try to get us to make temporal substitutes and think so long as we love naturally, God is satisfied, but natural love does not demonstrate the mind of God. It does not give glory to God. And it is our supernatural ability to love the unlovable that gives glory to God. And every fruit of the Spirit has a demonic counterfeit. They look like, smell like, and seem like the real thing. And if the enemy can fool us into thinking there's no difference, he has denied us the power of our testimony and cheated God out of doing supernatural things through us. Now I realize when I put this overhead up here that some of you are thinking the fruit of the Spirit has to be supernatural eyesight. I don't expect you to be able to read that. I just needed something to put up there. You have in your notes this chart. So if you'll look in, the, in your transcripts instead, it just does me good to put these things up here. I'm not sure why. But what this chart tells you is that there's a list of the fruit of the Spirit and a definition for each, and then a satanic substitute for each one and a description of that substitute. The fruit of the Spirit is love, the giving of one's life away with no regard to worth or response. Satan's substitute is worldly affection. It is a fake kind of love. It's emotional or physical satisfaction that pleases the one who loves. Joy. Confidence and rejoicing in who God is, regardless of the circumstances. That's joy. Satan's substitute is a fake kind of joy. He calls it happiness. It's that which brings satisfaction by creating pleasant circumstances. You see, God works through pressure. Satan works by removing pressure. You watch his approach to Jesus in the wilderness. And so his substitutes will almost always be that which is accomplished by circumstantial events. God's will almost always be that which is produced inwardly and flows outwardly in the midst of circumstances we would not choose. Peace is the third one. Quietness of heart, even amidst adverse condition, because God's love is unchanging. Peace of mind is 
Satan's fake, the absence of that which offends the flesh. The very definition, you look, look in your dictionary, the very definition of peace, the absence of hostility, the absence of difficulty. Not with God. And the same thing is true of patience, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and self-control. And they're listed in your notes. Now, how does this demonic task force go about its business? Now, I want you to remember its goal is to, minute, to diminish the word of God by disguising the character of God. And one way they do that is by counterfeiting the fruits of God. We looked at love. Let's look at joy. Joy is confidence that results in rejoicing based on who God is, no matter how the circumstances are. And actually, joy abounds when tribulation abounds. It's the opposite of the world's perspective. And we know that because God said it. Look at James chapter 1, verse 2. He said, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever trials of you face trials of many kinds. Hello? Why? Because you know that the testing of your faith is developing perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you might become mature and complete. Oh. And we also know, beloved, that when tribulation actually abounds, when the word is placed in your heart. Jeremiah fifteen sixteen. Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of my heart, for I am called by thy name. So God's concept of joy is one of that by focusing on him causes rejoicing and excitement even when the sky turns dark and there seems to be no hope. Man's concept is fostered by, fostered by Satan, superimposes the word joy over something the world calls happiness. And as with love, it is the exact opposite. To man, happiness is something you feel when everything's going well. You say, I am so happy I got that new job, it pays more. Great. But it may be that God was doing his greatest work in you in the job you had before. You say, I am so happy because I feel better. And we're happy for you, but the truth may be that God allowed that illness at least for a season to teach you to trust. You say, I'm happy, but, but jo joy can best be illustrated when there's no reason to be happy. Only then can some form of supernatural expression come out of your life, and the very thing that would cause others to despair causes you to rejoice. According to James, it's developing character in you. Let it happen. Another illustration is peace. To man, peace is the absence of that which offends. That's a di dictionary definition of it. We're at peace when we have no conflict to the unbelieving mind, but to God, peace is inner tranquility in the midst of conflict that can only be understood supernaturally. The Scripture says it passes all understanding. Patience, gentleness, goodness, and so forth. The, Satan's counterfeits are the opposite of, man, of God's. He walks for it. He'll try to emulate patience with tolerance, gentleness with apathy, goodness with self-righteousness, faith with presumption, meekness with weakness, self-control with legalism. And as we buy into the lie, it's a subtle kind of confusion that overcomes. It's a delicate approach to drawing us and taking us down the tube. It'll infiltrate our theology until we develop some kind of a self-serving kind of gospel that glorifies God if we feel good, if we look good, if we act good. If you can produce it in the flesh, beloved, it is not of God. And just as all the perks that Satan offered Jesus in the wilderness were physical counterfeits to God's supernatural power, he works the same way today. And that's one of the things demons do all day. They try to get you to stop short of allowing God's precious spirit, his supernatural power, to flow through you in the midst of difficulties. Satan's lie is if God loved you, there wouldn't be any difficulties. God's truth is that every difficulty is a tool allowed by God so that his spirit can manifest fruit in your life. And as he does, God gets the glory. Remove the source of the pressure, you move the catalyst for glory. So what do these demons do all day? They try to counterfeit the work of the spirit 
by creating cheap imitations of the real thing and making you think that without the miracle working power of God, you can live the Christian life. That's a lie. That's what demons do all the time. But there's a second kind of attack that's much more recognizable but equally effective. That's when Satan, having failed to win the battle through subtlety, begins to tempt you to do evil. That's what demons do all day, too. They lead you to believe God's forgiven you so you can now do whatever you want. And besides, you compare your morality with the world's or even with the church's, and you're doing okay. And those biblical standards, they're for another generation. They're just not practical. Well, let's take a look. We'll stay this morning with Galatians chapter 5, continue our look at the fruit of the Spirit, and see if we can see the other way that Satan attacks us. Galatians chapter 5, beginning with verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit lusts against the flesh. Now listen, these are contrary the one to the other. They cannot coexist, is what that means. So, so that you cannot do the things you would. But if you be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now, verse 19, the works of the flesh have been revealed. We know what they are. Here's what they are. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, which I told you before, I'm telling you again, these that do these things are not those that inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, and so forth. So when you're in the Spirit and walking in the Spirit, you manifest, verses 22 and 23, when Satan and his hosts are at work in your life and you allow them to influence you, verses 19 through 21, subtly at first, dramatically at last, will destroy your witness and deny you your power. Now, there's 17 attributes here of walking in the flesh. I think those 17 attributes actually fall into seven categories, basically. And these are the ways that Satan asks us to defy the Word of God. Once again... This overhead is not very readable for where you are, but if you look in your transcripts, it's there. This is the work of unclean spirits in the life of the believer. If you were to take those 17 attributes found in those verses and put them in groups, I think there are at least seven basic categories through which Satan tries to attack you. The first one is immoral behavior, lasciviousness, adultery, and fornication. Scriptural unlawful, scripturally unlawful moral behavior that violates the portrait of God's relationship with us. Now, every one of these groups of un, that the unclean spirits use to attack us in some way insults at least one of the attributes of God. In this case, His holiness. Secondly, there's spirit world contact or witchcraft. It's any act or activity that enters into contact with the spirit world apart from the Holy Spirit, and you deny the omnipotence of God. The third group are bitter spirits, hatred, variance, wrath, sedition, and strife. All of these are activities and attitudes that foster division, animosity, or maintain grudges. And you defy the love of God and the peace of God. The fourth group is a discontented spirit. It's emulations, envy, jealousy at the success of others or an unhealthy desire to have what others have. And you deny what? The sovereignty of God. The fifth one is idolatry. Any pattern of, of thoughts that focus on people, things, or experience instead of the Lordship of Christ and you defy the fact that God is a jealous God. The sixth is intoxication, drunkenness, and revelings. The partaking of any substance that takes control of your spirit away from the Holy Spirit. And you deny God's grace. The last one is heresy. The introduction of false doctrine or unnecessary argumentation which alters your concept of the nature of God or distracts you from worshiping the holiness of God and you defy His righteousness. 
So these guys, these demons have a lot to do, don't they? This passage contrasts the, what the Spirit of God does all day with what demons do all day. His Spirit wants to flow through you and create love, joy, peace, gentleness, patience, and so forth. Study those words in, in the next few weeks. Take each one of them one at a time. See what they mean and cross-reference them in Scripture and see what produces joy. You'll be amazed. See what produces peace. See what God uses to manifest self-control. It'll astound you. The very things we grumble about all day long are the things God arranges to allow His Spirit to flow through you so the world around you can be amazed. Now, but what do demons do all day? They fight the work of the Spirit of God with this sevenfold attack, according to Galatians 5, 17 through 19. They want to feed your thoughts with thoughts of immorality. They want you to toy with the spirit world. They want to encourage you to foster a bitter spirit. They want to encourage you to jealousy or discontentment. They want to tempt you to idolatry. And they want to draw you to anything that will intoxicate your mind, negating the work of the Spirit in you. And they ever so subtly want to infiltrate your mind with heresy so that you will either corrupt truth or deny truth. And, and in doing so, at least for the moment, they cause you to deny the holiness of God, the omnipotence of God, the love of God, the peace of God, the sovereignty of God, and so forth. God hates it. He doesn't love us any less when, when we fall for these ploys, but his heart is broken and our lives become broken. Now, what can we do about it? If these demons are at work trying to affect our every thought until those thoughts produce the pr fruit of the flesh, what can we do? How do we put on the armor? <clears throat> That's not a self-portrait. He's got hair. The first thing we do is recognize what he's trying to do so we can turn to Jesus the minute, the minute, underline, the minute those thoughts invade our mind. Because once you coddle those thoughts, whatever they are, and let them fester that much, the behavior that follows will ultimately be a given. We're going to grieve over the behavior and seek God's forgiveness and hopefully man's as well, but the truth is the sin started way back. The sin started the first time we decided to let the demonic thought pattern settle somewhere on the computer disk of our minds. We justified it because we didn't label it. We didn't label that file grievous sin called lust or horrendous sin called bitterness or anger. Satan slipped it into our minds and we called it harmless thought to be ignored. And that allowed the computer of our minds to treat it lightly, and we failed to see that that seemingly harmless, isolated thought was a missile shot by Satan in the war of wars, and it had deadly potential. We didn't put on the armor of God because you don't need to wear armor when you're not in danger, right? So we entertained a thought about how nice it would be to be intoxicated and forget everything for a while. You say, oh, well, I'm not going to do it. Oh, really? Really? But I don't believe anyone ever got drunk without first entertaining the idea. I don't believe anyone ever fostered anger or revenge without playing it over in the theater of their mind first. I don't think anyone ever envied without first picturing in their minds how wonderful it would be to live in that house, to drive that car, to have that wife or husband. The theater of the mind is where the previews are shown before the show comes on that brings down the house, your house, literally. See, no one ever committed immorality or adultery without toying with it first. The X-rated preview shown over and over in the mind seemed harmless at first. But after all, you surmise, everybody thinks about it, just so I don't do it. And then one day the opportunity comes and you fall and you can't imagine what happened. But, beloved, you fell years before. You fell the day you decided the show was harmless as long as you just thought about it. So Satan and his demonic host feeds you anything and everything to make those seven scenarios become reality. They want you to look at things that trigger thoughts of immorality. And we fall for it. They want us to take the spirit world lightly, even illustrations or entertainment about angels that aren't scripturally true. 
They want us to foster anger and develop a negative spirit because we've been wronged, right? Regardless of what 1 Peter 2 and 3 said. They want us to be discontent with what we have. And they'll see that our paths cross somebody's who have exactly what we think we have to have. They want us to idolize people or places or things rather than yielding to Christ. They want us to desire to flee our circumstances through some kind of substitute, alcohol, drugs, or anything that's a synthetic release. <coughs> and they want us to search for and find doctrine to argue over, or fret about, or cling to that isn't true. It may even be true, but used out of context, like Satan did in the wilderness, it'll drive us crazy. They know when to attack. They know when we're weakest. They know the impressions that we've allowed them to make in our hearts, and they love to keep beating and beating and beating down the same path. Once that hard disk has been programmed long enough, truth no longer filters it out. They know. The question we have to ask is, why don't we? Why do we take sin so lightly? Why do we give them such inroads into our spirits that we actually deceive ourselves? Why do we toy with these seven known sins of the flesh, this satanic kind of fruit bearing, and act as though nothing's ever going to happen? I'll tell you why. Because the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked, the scripture says. Who can know it? That's God's assessment. Galatians chapter 5, Paul wanted to make it so clear that even in our deceived condition, we could see the awesome contrast between what God produces and what Satan produces. And we can tell the difference when it comes out in gross behavior. Everyone in this room would call witchcraft and adultery and murder sin, right? Right. What we don't call sin is the thoughts we plant in the garden of our hearts that finally grow into massive weeds that choke out the work of Word of God. See, we don't see anything wrong with weeds, do we? We mow them down every once in a while, and then they look green again, don't they? But we don't realize that unless we pull them out by their roots, they'll sprout again. And one day they'll crush and kill the seed of the Word of God. Beloved, I'm convinced it isn't what demons do all day that makes us fall. It's what we let them do. And the body of Christ, for the most part today, no longer grieves over the sins of the mind. We don't preach repentance based on what we think rather than what we do. We no longer see every idle thought, every vile thought as an affront to the cross on which Jesus died. We fail to grasp that God commanded us to bring every thought captive to the mind of Christ. Every thought. We think if our children say the right things and mimic our spiritual jargon, they must have pure hearts. It's not true. We think if those we disciple do their homework on time, they must be growing spiritually. Not true. We think that if our congregation is faithful to give, they must be faithful in giving their hearts to Christ. Not necessarily so. Beloved, we all love to play games. We love to dress up in our spiritual tuxedos and think God is impressed in our heart of hearts while in the meantime we're harboring thoughts that make God want to spew us out of his mouth. Don't blame the demons, beloved. They're just doing their job. And because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, we don't have any excuses. God's word is stronger than anything Satan and his unholy, unclean spirits can conjure up. That's why Jesus, even in his weakened condition in Matthew chapter 4, never gave an inch. He simply had his Father's word stored up in his heart, and he said, It is written, it is written, it is written. So I'm going to close this morning by answering a question, I hope. What do we do with what these demons do all day? First of all, we repent. Now, I know that's a dirty word. It's, a, it's what they call a yuck word in our vocabulary today. But in the Word of God, it's a good word. Repent. It means to recognize sin for what it is and turn away from it. Not slightly away. Not to where we can still glance at it. It means all the way around. 
that occasional lustful thought laid up in the heart to toy with is sin. Grievous sin. No excuses. It is sin. Confess it. You say, well, I have to confess it 300 times a day. Good. That'll keep you busy. Every time it surfaces, the minute it surfaces, you say, dear God, that is sin. That discontented spirit that can't be satisfied with its lot in life is sin. You say, but John and Mary have it all, and they don't love the Lord like I do. Big deal. I'll tell you something. God didn't say that loving him would give you a bigger house. He said it would give you a better heart. There's a big difference. Envy is sin. That bitter spirit that makes your heart race whenever somebody mentions one person's name or something that's happened, it's sin. The demons know it. Why don't we? It causes you to lose the peace of God and deny the love of God. You say, I don't, everybody hates him. You can't if you want God's best. You have to choose to love your enemies, to do good to them that persecute you and say all manner of evil against you. You love them, you bless them, you do good to them, you don't hate them. You say, yeah, but I've hated that guy for 20 years. By now you ought to know it hadn't produced one godly fruit in your life. Give it up. Trade it in for love, joy, peace, patience. Then begin to lay up the Word of God in your heart, line upon line, precept upon precept, but do it in the very areas where your hard disk is corrupted. Put it in the same folder. Store God's Word about God's nature in your heart. If you struggle with anger, then, then find what God, how God feels about anger and what aspect of God's nature is violated over that anger, and you meditate on it day and night. You replace the corrupted material with new material in the same folder on the hard drive of your heart. And you meditate on it day and night, day and night, day and night. And the minute Satan throws this garbage at you, these, these arrows at you, and the, and the thoughts come back into your mind that you programmed there, you say, but it is written. And he'll flee. And the final key is this, beloved, you start today, not tomorrow. We love Mondays, don't we? Because we can figure out the rest of Sunday. We don't have to do anything. The problem is by tomorrow, the seed will be gone. Satan is a seed snatcher. Tomorrow doesn't really ever come, and the demons aren't going to wait till tomorrow. They're busy today harassing you, tempting you, and attempting to deceive you. Now, folks, that's what demons do all day. Unless you choose not to let them. Our Father and our God, by your grace, may we put on the armor, stand in the gap, and watch the enemy get on his bicycle and head west. Father, by your grace, may some of us here today begin to recognize clearly sin in our hearts that may not have demonstrated itself yet in some of the overt ways that the flesh reveals itself. But from your perspective, the dirty deeds are already done because they've been done in our hearts. And some of us this morning, Father, need to repent. We need to call sin, sin. We need to understand that what demons do all day is just play on our weaknesses. And if we choose to let them, they're not to be glorified. We're to be blamed. It just isn't necessary. Even if we've been plagued with the same problems for 30 or 40 years, the victory is still ours. And by your grace this week, May we begin to experience that victory and live in the sheer glory of it. In Jesus' name, amen.